Greetings friends, Ken McHale for Jazz Vinyl Lover back. Or rather the Jazz Vinyl Audio File. I can't remember even what I call myself anymore. Um, I wanted to do another one of my world famous 5x5 record challenge where I pull out five records from behind me, which is now over there, and give you my thumbnail sketch of the record without knowing exactly what it is. But I wanted to give you a heads up for future videos. I am going to do a video solely on the Blue Note Blue Note 80th Anniversary reissues. There's one. There's another one. And there's, yep, one more. And I also just received the Joe Henderson a record on Blue Note. So I'm going to do a, a review of these. I know a lot of people in my jazz vinyl group have bought these, and people seem to love them, but I'll you know try to do a critical assessment. And also, I'm really excited about reviewing this. Uh, Blue Note's big deluxe box series. This one is called Spirit and Time. Um, they've done volume one. This is volume two. This is a really big box set. It comes with three LPs. And, and this one is focused on drummers, Spirit and Time. And uh, it has uh, a reissue of an Art Blakey record. And I can't remember the other record they reissued in there. I have a crap memory. Uh, and also a record of... Uh, drummers on Blue Note, their composition performed by some uh, current drummers like the great Kendrick Scott. Um, so that's for an upcoming uh, review, but this box is really beautiful. The reissue album covers are really beautiful. Uh, some of the best reissue covers I've ever seen. You know, the Music Matters reissue covers are great, but I think they're overkill. They're too heavy, they're too glossy, they're a bit much. Probably no one agrees with me. These hit the perfect note of of a heavyweight cover with perfect colors. Heavyweight jacket, perfect colors. Anyway, that'll be upcoming. But to get to our five by five series. Oh, and today, in the background, another 12 year old pianist, Brandon Goldberg, Let's Play. I actually like this guy a lot better than Joey Alexander. He sounds more like a grown up. This includes Ben Wolf and Donald Edwards. This is a pretty great CD. It's a CD so I don't have to like wonder if I'm running out of space or whatever. Um, but back to our 5x5. Five five. These are just five records I just pull out and I tell you what I know about them. Uh, this is a, uh, a Blue Note. This is a Japanese reissue of Hank Mobley, 1540 with Donald Byrd and Lee Morgan. Um, this era of Hank Mobley records which is early on before what I think of as the classic period of Workout, No Room for Squares, Caddy for Daddy, but after Soul Station, which is an incredible record. Uh, this era seems to focus more on blowing sessions. Uh, Donald Berg, Lee Morgan, uh, with Paul Chambers, Charlie Persip. There's only two tunes per side. Touch and Go, Double Whammy, Barrels of Funk, and Mobley Mania. Um, Whenever you see like two, tune, two tunes per side, you can be sure this is a blowing session. You know, kind of just a simple head that everyone takes long solos, uh, which is something you more ordinarily hear on a prestige record. But uh, as I said, this is early era of Blue Note 1540. The Blue Note 1500 series uh, is the, the first 33 and a third LP pressings, that first series, mostly on Lexington uh, Avenue. Uh, mostly deep groove, some with what they call a ridged perforated edge or is also known as the flat rim, all with an RVG etched. There's RVG etched, RVG stamped, Van Gelder stamped, uh, Van Gelder stereo stamped, but the original 1500 series of Blue Notes and there's certain ways you can tell you a first pressing, there's the ear or rather the, in the dead wax, the ear as it's referred to, but it's really a P for Plastilite, the pressing corporation at New Jersey. Uh, deep Groove, which is a ridge um, in the label around Circumference Ridge, and what I said, the flat rim, which is very unique to find. But anyway, this record is just a blowing session, but it's a great blowing session with Donald Burr, Lee Morgan, and Hank Mobley. Now, granted, that might be kind of interesting to hear Mar Morgan and Bird in the same room. Um, it's interesting. I also think it's interesting the incredible love for Lee Morgan. Of course, it's totally deserved. But um, I think because of the movie, he's become this uh, in-depth, iconic image of what jazz is. Also, his records are so clean and pure in a way. He was a, he was a real artist. But it's like, it's like the jazz world or the collector, collectors have sort of forgotten about 
Freddie Hubbard. I mean, Freddie Hubbard was perhaps a better trumpet player, technically speaking, than Lee Morgan, uh, a more aggressive player in a way. Um, but anyway, food for thought. That's that one. And then I pulled out, I recently re-alphabetized all my vinyl by artist. And uh, so it's easier to find things for me. This is Duke Ellington on French CBS um, monologue. There's a whole series of these French CBS records, and this is primarily the early Duke Ellington Orchestra, um, such as uh, 1947 through 1951. Um, this is when, this is before Ellington is sort of famous in a way across the world. He wasn't quite the statesman of jazz, the elder statesman of jazz that he would become, um, but perhaps his genius is shining more brightly. Uh, the bands on this era of all these French RCAs, the French RCA or oh, French CBS, I'm sorry, the bands are just phenomenal. They play like a non, they play like a sextet, not a big band. They're swinging their asses off. The music is really catchy. Um, some of the titles: "Stop Look and Listen," "Rock Slipping at the Blue Note," "Chain My Way," "Sultry Serenade," "Women," "Fancy Dan," "Brown Betty." Brown Betty's a popular track. Uh, Three Cent Stop on a Turquoise Cloud. Lady of the Lavender Mist, the Clothed Woman, Monologue. Uh, these are sort of thin jackets, but I could I can say without reservation if you find one of these Duke Ellington on CBS Jazz, there's the logo. It's number 20 in the series. If you find one of these, just buy it. They're not expensive when you find them, um, and they're they're really really great. You know, as Duke goes on, he gets on CBS. Uh, he becomes more of a world statesman in jazz, and as happens with any great artist, the, the performances come become a little more, you know what to expect, because they're not as young, but these early records are just amazing. And there's also the entire uh, RCA Bluebird series of Duke, those are all phenomenal. Uh, so anyway, there's that one. There's another one called Primping at the Prom that I really love by that. And I was going to do uh, just a single uh, episode on Duke, on uh, Elvin Jones, because Elvin Jones, it took, if you're a drummer, Elvin Jones is just as important as John Coltrane. Elvin Jones, of course, the drummer in Coltrane's great uh, quartet, quintet, quartet, anyway. Um, and, you know, I, I was lucky enough to see Elvin. I've interviewed him and I saw him once in the uh, late 80s at the Blue Note here in New York. I'd never seen him before. Uh, Sunny Fortune on sax. I forgot who the rest of the rhythm section was. But Elvin starts playing, and it's like something descends from the clouds. There, he was just this force, this power that took over the room. And it's not strictly about volume, even though he was a loud drummer. He could play very quietly as well, obviously. And he had that amazing triplet, galvanic, tumbling flow that was his and his alone, one of the great innovations in jazz. But some sort of force, some presence, spirit entered the room when he started playing. It was just, I remember I went with my friend Zach Danziger, who's now a very well-known drummer in his own right, and we were just, we were as floored with his volume as the time we saw Tony Williams play. You were just kind of like, what? Nobody does that now, nobody would have the nerve. But those guys were both so musical and such masters, and that was part of the power of what they were doing, part of their style, part of their innovation. But anyway, this is on the PM label with Jan Hammer and Gene Perla. Uh, you know, Elvin cut a few albums on Blue Note, quite a few actually, actually. and I, I like the ones, there's a trio with Joe Farrell, Th those are some of my favorites. And in trio format, he's just a monster. And there's uh, Gene Perla on bass, and Jan Hammer. Jan Hammer, who went on to play with the Mahavishnu Orchestra. What year is this? This is 75, so Jan Hammer is already out of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Gene Perla, the great bassist. Um, Jan Hammer, courtesy of Nemperer Records, same label Stanley Clark was on after, uh, after the demise of the, of the uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Um, I have a lot of Elvin records, and when I do the Elvin video, I'll go into detail on my favorite ones. I really don't know this one as well, but you can expect from Elvin just incredible power, incredible swing. Uh, when I interviewed him, well, I'll save the story till later, but I also interviewed him with John Riley at his apartment at uh, Central Park West, and he was such a gentle, man, such a gentleman, and so sweet and personable, and his wife Kiko, I believe her name was there, but we'll leave that for that. This is that era, Walter uh, Willis Jackson, Cool Gator on Prestige. Um, 
This is the era of prestige records where saxophone holds king. Uh, you know, from my hero, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, Willis Jackson, um, Jimmy Forrest, Arnett Cobb. There's a whole legion of amazing saxophonists, late 50s, early 60s, on prestige. This recording is from, we don't have a date, do we? I'm guessing this is late 50s, early 60s, and the beautiful laminated cover. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a fine point between jazz and more R&B playing in this era. Willis Jackson sort of steps back and forth all the time. Arnett Cobb, I think of as a pure, more of an R&B player. Um, Coleman Hawkins could do it all, obviously. R&B, whatever. He could play with Sonny, he could play with Tran, he could play with anybody. But Willis Jackson is sort of a, a, a very defined thing. But there is a ambiance, there is a feel, a mood to these early 60s, late, early, late 50s, early 1960s prestige organ-led records. This includes Bill Jennings on guitar, Jack McDuff on organ, Alvin Johnson on drums, Mill Hinton on bass, Wendell Marshall on bass, Tommy Potter on bass, Buck Clark on conga drum. I have a problem with the conga drum on some of these records. You know, that the conga drum in the late 50s was literally coming from the whole fascination with Latin music of the time, which Dizzy Gillespie and Machito popularized earlier, of course, but also on TV shows like I Love Lucy. You know, she was married to Ricky from Ricky, you know, I, forgot, I forgot what their name was. But uh, he runs the Afro-Cuban Latin band because he's from Cuba. And my mother, she has told me that uh, you know that was a very popular thing. My mother married a foreigner, or rather, a man from another country, and that was a very popular thing among uh, in American culture then, and you know, uh, t embracing the whole Latin uh, culture. And so, on a lot of these saxophone-based records, you have conga drum, and it drives me nuts. Doom doom Sorry, my phone's ringing. Doom doom I mean, if you fall, if you just get in the groove, it's probably cool. It's probably more that I'm a drummer, and if, as a drummer, if you have, a, if you're playing in a percussion section, you have to play less because you have somebody else holding down the uh, the rhythm. So, but anyway, this is one of these great records that's right in the cut. That's sort of kind of slow tempos. These guys play tempos that no one plays anymore in jazz really slow like it's 2 a.m. we're in a bar there's three people there but um and you can't just get any album by Willis Jackson because as I said some of them will just fall over into R&B which is cool but it turns more into like the stuff I was talking about on the compilation honkers and bar walkers you know uh, such as there's so many of those things and they were popularized on radio and in rock and roll but it ain't jazz this album is jazz and it's swinging and it's cool Cool Gator Willis Jackson. And this, I think I paid 20 bucks for this, if you can find it. Not a hard record to find. Um, and it's an original, I'll show you the label. This is an original Deep Groove Prestige recording, Washington Avenue uh, from New Jersey. Some people call this the uh, fireworks label because I guess it has fireworks going on. There's a deep groove in there, and in the dead wax we have an RBG extra. We have an RBG stamp, Rudy Van Gelder stamp, recorded at Inglewood Cliffs. And finally, I have this kind of weird record that I pulled out. I've only seen it a couple of times. Johnny Griffin, the saxophonist, with Wilbur Ware, the great sort of unacknowledged bass player and innovator, just as much as someone like Milt Hinton, prior to Ball Chambers or Jimmy Garrison or any of those heavy-duty cats. Um, on Jazz Land, an offshoot of Prestige, I believe, my memory is failing me, um, with Junior Mance, you see? Uh, Junior Mance was um, a piano player, very much in kind of the R&B cut. Again, you have that R&B influence in jazz. And uh, later that would be like Ramsey Lewis, uh, you know, who became much, much more popular and more commercial, nowhere near as good as far as I'm concerned. But um, this is all based on players out of Chicago. Focus, you bitch, the Chicago Cookers. Uh, with Johnny Griffin tenor sax, John Jenkins alto sax, Junior Man's piano, Wilbur Ware bass, he's credited as the leader, with Wilbur Campbell, a drummer I really don't know, or Frankie Dunlop on drums. Frankie Dunlop, who went on to great fame with uh, Monk as part of one of his great rhythm sections. And this, once again, is because it's based as a prestige record, I think I'm correct about that, 
Jazzland was sort of another offshoot of uh, Prestige. It's kind of a blowing session, but it's fun, you know. Uh, it's not like, if you really want to hear Johnny Griffin, you want to get the Blue Note sessions uh, introducing. That is just, you know, Johnny Griffin was an amazing uh, tenor saxophonist. Had as much technique as anybody, could blow as ferocious as anybody, but never quite achieved the, the popularity, at least now, obviously of a, of a John Coltrane or even a Hank Mobley. I feel like Johnny Griffin is not quite there. I don't know why. Um, because he lived into the 70s or 80s and was playing all the time and really perfected what he did. But if you get the uh, any of those early Johnny Griffin records on Blue Note, they are just blowing the walls down. They're phenomenal. Um, but anyway, the Chicago Cookers on Jazzland. And I see this record around from time to time. It's not in perfect shape. Anyway, it's Ken McAuliffe, Jazz, Vinyl, Audiophile, 5x5. Thanks for checking in. I really appreciate you all uh, watching my videos. I give them my best shot. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.